It's exciting and it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Sam and his colleagues and the Adam Smith Institute. Um, it was Sam who, uh, I, I said, hey, I want to do a book tour, and he wanted to do this paper. Which, so you have to blame him for this. It's not really about the book. Um, and when he said he wanted to do this, and I said, fine, that'll be fun. Uh, and I assumed we would be six of us little libertarian sectarians gathered, so I'm quite overwhelmed by uh, the interest in this today. Um, I asked Sam to print out all the slides so I can move quick. We're, I know we're going to have to skip some and not read the quotes and so on. Um, but at least you have that, and maybe you can have your pen handy if you get a question or, 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 or want to make a remark. Uh, but I guess I'll blow through this really uh, for a while um, and try to, you know, I hope we have enough time for some questions. Um, the mirror is kind of like mere Christianity, sort of a big tent, and that's, I think, the spirit uh, of the libertarianism uh, that I'm pushing towards here. Here's a, sort of a 20th century story, at least from here. These two people were both heavily influenced by uh, their common mentor, Mises. He was more, be more of a mentor to him than he was to him. I think he was more mature and formed and different uh, all along. Um, and these guys have been, you know, epic figures, I'd say, in the 20th century uh, renaissance of classical liberalism uh, and, and the American libertarian scene. Um, and what I think I'm driving toward is a blending, uh, which, as it were, takes the better parts of both, and in a way returns back to this. I'm actually more of a fan of Hume and Smith than I am of the 20th century figures, even Hayek. Um, I think that mere libertarianism is increasingly the way people think of libertarianism. So I think I'm uh, saying and endorsing uh, a trend that's in motion and relating it to these two figures. Um, the most essential characteristic, as I see it, is favoring, by and large, more liberty. It's not about axioms or non-aggression principles, deduction, and so much, so, so, so on. <clears throat> um, I think that semantics are an essential part of classical liberal culture and thinking. Um, <clears throat> I'd say especially the distinction between voluntary and coercive action uh, and the liberal conceptions of ownership that it's, that it's based on, and that's really our basis for our definition of liberty. These are, I, I think, the most important words of liberal culture. All of these words are greatly confused and often directly subverted towards the end of the 19th century and moving forward, and now we're in an age of cultural confusion engulfed by social democratic political reaction to uh, the age of liberalism as I see it. Nothing says that more than how, I how much trouble I have using this word in the country I hail from. Um, okay. <clears throat> so there's, defin there's the definition of liberty with its sort of central idea, and we should distinguish that from claims for liberty. And I suggest that on the definition of liberty, Rothbard's pretty darn good. Uh, I, I, I like his elaboration of, as it were, the definition of liberty, particularly in this book, but in his other works as well. Uh, he actually made a project of defining liberty. He also made claims for it, which I'm not so enthusiastic about. Um, but it seems to me that uh, this is one matter where um, I favor Rothbard, and that's a very important matter. Um, so on this first issue, I, in my scorecard, as it were, <laughs> Rothbard wins. Hayek is quite obscure in the definition of liberty. Now I think there are a lot of obscurities uh, in, in it, uh, uh, and maybe more than Rothbard recognized. Um, but um, Hayek was, I think, quite obscure, contradictory, multiple, and so on. Um, he tended to define liberty in terms of some of its appealing correlates. 
I think that between the lines, one can read Locke come Rothbard, if you will, into Hayek's liberty, but in word, Hayek does not provide any such um, hearty definition. It may have been for the best that Hayek was obscure in this fashion had he been more explicit and made it clear that he was thinking about a basic distinction like fellows like this, he would have been dismissed at the time and even more marginalized. Whether this was conscious or not, or how conscious, I would only speculate. But in a way, it may have been for the best that he was obscure in the definition. Now, on, the, on Rothbard's definition, I work towards an idea of the, what I call the liberty principle. Um, and it works from the status quo, which is not actually a very Rothbardian anchor. He likes to think about the libertarian ideal, the end zone, if you let me use the American football analogy. Um, and these reforms, R1 and R2, are reforms from the status quo, where we're at, as it were. Um, and, and liberty can sometimes rank two such reforms. And I have this little symbol here as an ordering, okay, which ranks R1 and R2. If R1 is abolishing the minimum wage and R2 is the status quo, which is to say no reform at all, you know, we would have R1 ranking higher in liberty. This is a way of thinking about liberty as a statement about uh, at least the ranking of policy reforms. Now, there's a very important, I think, quite important distinction to bring in here. It's kind of complicating things right away, but let's try to get it out of the way. It is possible that a reform that increases the direct initiation of coercion will, in the long run, reduce coercion. These are a couple of possible examples. The, the policy itself, or the reform itself, um, might score higher in liberty than the alternative reform within the status quo, but, um, or lower in liberty, but have the opposite ranking in a more overall sense. Um, like if you have an urban riot, imposing a curfew is sort of a direct initiation of coercion by the police, but if it quells initiation of coercion by rioters, it might, that might redeem the increased coercion of the police in imposing the curfew. I wrote a whole paper with Michael Clark on this distinction. I think they're real and important. And in fact, I think one of the things that, one of the ways to, dis to distinguish or negotiate the differences between libertarians and conservatives is that libertarians see less disagreement between direct and overall, whereas conservatives see more relative to libertarians disagreement. So what do we do? This, this is sort of the direct, the, based on the initiation of coercion by the policy itself and concomitant enforcement. And you could go all the way out speculating into the future of the overall effects of such a reform uh, based on a prediction of coercion resulting from ramifications of the policy. So this outer point, which is not clearly defined, I realize, but still the outer edge of what we can talk about would be the overall, and this would be the direct, and that would be the basis of two different notions, and if you will, orderings by liberty. So liberty itself is an ambiguous ranking to this extent. Um, and which should we use? Ultimately, we care more about this. Presumably, this ultimately tracks the desirable better than this. I mean, this subsumes that. So overall, <coughs> would be truer to our ultimate ethics. Um, however, this is very vague. We don't have good agreement on the long-run consequences of going to war or imposing a curfew or liberalizing finance, financial operations for which taxpayers might ultimately be on the hook and so on. And to keep things kind of clear in our liberty talk, what we do is we tend to work with this. And I think that's what libertarians in the US do anyway. Maybe it's different here, I'm not sure. Um, and so I'm going to stick with this, but I've gone through all this just to show that there is this issue. And we're making a decision in opting with uh, direct liberty, which I do think is in very much in the, in the 
spirit of American libertarianism. So we have an order. And it's the direct liberty order, and that's what the little D is for. <clears throat> it's grounded in the status quo. It ranks dyadic reforms. It's presumably transitive about the reforms. Um, claims for liberty involve judgments about liberty as a principle for action and policy. We need a principle relating it to the desirable. So this, finally, is the liberty principle. It's, it's, you're wondering why this notation, but I actually find it kind of useful. Um, when R1 rates higher in liberty than R2, then favor, then favor R1 over R2, OK? In other words, when it's higher in liberty, it's higher in this D here now is desirability. Um, but sometimes when you want to clarify the cases and distinctions you're talking about, this comes in handy. Now about this desirability ordering, this is in the loose, vague, and indeterminate, as Adam Smith would put it. Again, it ranks dyadic reforms. It reflects your judgment, which buttons you push. It emerges from your sensibilities, which are deep and complex, not something you can fully or clearly articulate or turn into a formula. Don't even try it. Smith scoffs at such an idea. Claims for the liberty principle. Rothbard's were too strong, too categorical, too simplistic, too absolute. I will set out five limitations of his claims or his type of claims. So you see, this is primarily really a critique of Rothbard. <clears throat> um, ambiguity. Rothbard tended to make it sound cut and dry, but there are many gray areas. Here's just a few. Um, they're all over the place. Sometimes we are uncertain about whether this ranks higher than that, even in terms of direct liberty, or that ranks higher than that, because we're not sure what liberty means, what property means, what messing with someone's property means in this case. Here's a nice quote, some nice quotes from Hayek. Um, where he shows sensitivity that Rothbard glosses over, or, or even maybe perhaps explicitly denies. So that's one, ambiguity. Second, undesirability. Lib uh, Rothbard treated the liberty principle as an axiom. He made 100% like, like an ethical trump. He made 100% claims for it. Um, whereas Hayek condoned some coercive government actions, rejecting 100%. So for Hayek, it would be more of a maxim, a 90-something percent. And you might make a distinction here between a natural axiom, as Rothbard touts it, versus a natural maxim. And I believe in the natural maxim, and I believe in natural here in a Hume-Smith sense. Even though Hume said that justice is an artificial virtue, he actually comes around and says, should make a big deal out of this natural, artificial, in another sense, it's natural. Um, and I think he was winking at us about the natural talk. Um, so here again, on the question of sometimes it fails desirability, uh, I, I reject Rothbard in favor of Hayek, which is to say sometimes we don't follow the liberty principle. Sometimes coercion is our friend. Uh, here are some possible examples. You know, we could come up with others. Uh, immigration might be an interesting one that's not on my list. Um, some of these bring us back to issues of direct versus overall, but it doesn't really matter. There's still pure undesirability. And even if you had an overall liberty ranking, I don't think we should insist on a 100% claim. There may be, well be cases where even we would depart from overall liberty for the sake of desirability very much against the spirit of Rothbard. All this helps us to avoid brittleness. 100% claims are brittle. You show one counterexample and it shatters. So I don't think it's been really good, good for liberty, the Rothbardian strain. So on ambiguity, Hayek wins. On undesirability, Hayek wins. This is a little elaboration about separating desirability from liberty. Um, again, the maxim is 90-something percent. That doesn't mean it's not still a principle. Exceptions don't destroy principlehood, if you will. 
This was very much part of the Scottish Enlightenment. They allowed exceptions. It was still a principle and it made for a presumption, which put the burden of proof on the contraveners of the principle. And that's, I think, the spirit we should have, that, that, that Scottish spirit. Um, they both, however, failed to say that sometimes coercion is our friend. And you could think of that, see, I, I remember Hayek, I didn't like on the definition of liberty, and you could say that Hayek molded his definition of liberty to fit his sensibilities about the desirable. In some cases, you actually kind of see him building the desirable into his definition of liberty. And in both cases, you could kind of see, it's a little more clear with him, that they both avoid ever saying, sometimes coercion is our, vent, our friend, him by in some sense screwing up the definition, him by in some sense making his sensibilities about the desirable fit his definition. And so both of these, I think, are wrong, and this is um, what I'm advocating, and this, I think, is very much in line with uh, the namesake of our institution here. Here's a quote, uh, an interesting quote about small denomination notes, where he actually says, this, is a vi this, this certainly seems to be a violation of natural liberty, but I'm for it. It's an exception. I don't think he does a great job of actually overcoming that burden of proof. Uh, as he, I don't think he did a great job on usury and maybe a few other cases, but that's sort of neither here nor there. He actually explicit. I think this is a very important passage because it makes it clear that he's saying, I've got this principle and, I'm, and it's not 100%, but it's still a principle and the burden of proof is on uh, the, the contraveners. Exactly as Bentham said to Smith when he said on usury, he said, you taught us that we should have this presumption and that the contraveners should... Uh, provide the burden of proof. And frankly, sir, as much as I admire you and love you, I don't think you've done so on the matter of usury. JB says, say, does say so something similar. So I'm invoking guys like that. Now another dimension of all this is incompleteness. The liberty principle is an incomplete guide to public policy, for in many cases it simply does not apply. There are many, many questions which are just not liberty questions. They're about government resources and the governance or use of government resources, for example. And it's foolish to think that this is a liberty issue. The government, as it were, is the owner of those resources. They should be granted a legitimacy and authority, as Hume and Smith would, and they have their decisions to make. Rothbard, on the other hand, suggests that such questions are beyond the pale of reason discourse. You know, he kind of wanted to say, well, the resources should be privatized. That's all there is really to know or say about this. Again, trying to make the confine issues to the liberty principle. And here again, I think Hayek was much better. <coughs> so on incompleteness, Hayek too gets a check above Rothbard. Um, this is a little kind of schematic, you know, conceptual thing with these three practical limitations just discussed. And you, if you pick, up a, you pick out an issue, you could kind of think about, is this an ambiguity issue, or is it more of an undesirable, undesirability <coughs> issue, or it's an exception to the liberty principle, or is it an incompleteness issue? Um, and, and I think in my paper, I f use a few examples to, as it were, locate them in that space. Two philosophical weaknesses of Rothbard. Libertarian policy does not serve all human <coughs> values. Collective romance, what I've called the people's romance, would be one, identity <coughs> issues are related, would be another. Um, and, you know, on some human values, this is not the most effective answer. Uh, and you gotta make a choice. It's like, you gotta kind of, it's, if you're gonna go with this, you gotta say, yeah, I recognize this, but this is not worth the cost in other dimensions. Rather than pretend that this wins on all fronts. Um, Rothbard, I think, would, would, would have a dismissive tone uh, view of any other such values. <clears throat> Hayek was better. Uh, some quotes here, I won't read them, but you have more of that sense that he's got a moral vision and it's a choice and it doesn't serve all moral visions or all moral values. And then the other philosophical limitation is foundation. He acted like we could fully articulate 
our sensibilities, provide sort of an algorithm of desirability. Um, it was sort of, liberty was sort of a supreme moral and ethical imperative. Um, whereas Hayek is much less foundationalist, even anti-foundationalist perhaps. He was sort of a postmodern before the, the age of that in a way. Um, and this is a nice quote to that effect, but I won't read it. So there again, Hayek gets some checks that Rothbard, you know, rather than Rothbard. <clears throat> so I've listed all these limitations of claims for liberty, these five, in fact, you see checked here. Does it survive those limitations? And I say, yeah. Um, one of the reasons to explore them is to see that they are not fatal. All rival ideologies are plagued by similar limitations, and maybe more, or at least maybe worse. In fact, I think most of them are worse. If we have a by and large 90% something principle, a lot of them don't even have principles, right? They just look mush. Um, so I say liberty still remains a cogent t challenge, um, and, it, and, and so on. All right, so here I go into how Rothbard was a challenger, picking up on the challenging and analytical <coughs> powers of the liberty principle. Um, and I'm gonna have to skip all this bargaining and challenging analysis um, in the interest of time. Uh, I'm for both, I'm for both, uh, as well as um, what I also term royalty. And these are the only two figures I really see in this camp where they're both first among their peers and then their peers are, as it were, a mountaintop in the culture of the society generally. And both of these gentlemen, uh, I think, pretty well fit that description. Um, but this, this trichotomy of bargaining, challenging, and loyalty, I just think we'll have to leave <coughs> aside. As for the name of the Party of Liberty, um, I don't really want to get into this. I'm not at all that wedded to libertarian. You can see in the title of my book that I use liberal. Um, I kind of see libertarianism becoming more Smithian, and I would also like to see liberalism return to being more Smithian. And you know, so I think different contexts make different terms useful. This paper was published in 2004, and I've become a little less libertarian talk oriented, but I'm still quite happy with, with this paper. Um, so, summing up, attitudes of this mere libertarianism. View it as being concerned only with legal and policy issues, not as a system of more moral or ethical principles for human conduct. It is not a philosophy of life. See, being a libertarian to mean merely tending to favor policy reforms toward more liberty, or degovernmentalization, if you like. Formulate political questions in terms of policy brass tacks, uh, as the Adam Smith Institute does. Formulate policy issues chiefly as a choice between alternative reforms to current arrangement. Keep it anchored in the status quo, rather than as policy for some ideal society. Um, like I'm not entirely opposed to the more utopian discourse, um, but it should be primary. Uh, in other words, focus on directions, not destinations. Define liberty pretty much as Rothbard does. Mind the liberty principles, three practical limitations, ambiguity, undesirability, and incompleteness. Admit that there are some human values, I'm sorry, that some human values are ill-served by libertarian reform. Argue for your judgments, but do not attempt to provide an algorithm for judgment or a full account of your sensibilities. View government officials as amenable to intellectual and moral instruction. Um, I just came from Sweden, where there's a right alliance of power, and you guys have David Cameron as your prime minister, so um, some things aren't going so badly. Let's see about the U.S. Say that. <laughs> you wouldn't say that. Um, view government as the agent that validates and institute libertarian reform. As I see it, there is at least one necessary and important role for government, and that is the dismantling of other roles of government. Um, so, that didn't take so long.